recorded. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome in. We're going to get started shortly. Just going to give it like a minute for people to file in and, uh, you know, get welcome to the space, um, you know, get settled, uh, make space in, in your day. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, definitely a pleasure to be able to share this with you guys. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be off and running in just 30 seconds or so. And, uh, yeah, that's the story. Okay. Top of the hour. We're going to get going. So hi everyone. My name's Josh. Uh, I'm going to be leading this today. Um, we're going to be talking about provoking productive conflict. And uh, my goal here is that you walk away with some really useful tools to leverage conflict on your teams um, and essentially engage in passionate but productive debates. Um, so that's the goal for today. And uh, I'll aim to provide as much value as I can to you. Um, thank you, everyone. For for coming. I know we probably have some people here today from the D and D event that I hosted, uh, not too long ago in September, the space one, as you can see, I've kept my background. Um, and, uh, yeah, really, really a pleasure to have you here. So, uh, hopefully you'll get to see me in a new light, not just as the D and D guy here, but, uh, some other things here as well. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Joshua Selesnick. I work here at Valiantis as a internal uh, and external team builder and coach. Uh, I have a bunch of different uh, offerings that I do in terms of uh, retrospectives for scrum masters and and one on one coaching for team leads. Um, so that's that's my background, and I come from uh, many years of training in in team and leadership experience. Um as well as just a, a fascination for, for teams and what makes them work and what makes them successful on an interpersonal level. So, um, so that's me uh, here. And let me give you an idea of what we're going to be going over today. Um, so we're going to be dealing with uh, conflict in the workplace and what productive conflict looks like. I want to help you be able to identify when productive conflict is happening. Um, it's not always easy to figure it out because it can still feel uncomfortable. Um, and I want to give you some of the theory behind why it's useful from a couple of the books and share with you some resources that you can dig into more on your own. If you're into, you know, saying, listening to things on audible or podcasts, um, I'll be giving you some additional resources. And uh, then we're going to go over five different tools that you can practically implement uh, and walk away from this meeting and be able to use yourself with your teams. Um, and that's going to be one of the first things that, that we cover will be those, those five tools. will be the bulk of the, of the talk today. And uh, at the very end of the talk, for those of you who are into D&D or curious about it, I'm going to talk about how I use Dungeons & Dragons to um, stimulate productive conflict and create kind of a safe space to do it. It's something that we've implemented at Valiantis to, uh, to some pretty solid degree of success. Um, so I'll talk about our methods and even share with you a confluence space, uh, a demo that we've created for one of our particular, particular adventure paths. Um, and uh, it'll be very different than the space-themed one. This will be more high fantasy. So for my Lord of the Rings fans out there, stay tuned. Um, it'll be really fun. So that is, uh, let me just adjust my camera here, so I'm looking at you. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today. So provoking productive conflict, how to make meetings exciting and get the most out of them. Um, so our goal here today is to make your meetings more exciting. That is to say the points when you are talking with someone, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group, more exciting. How does making meetings more exciting help? Well, first off, it probably shouldn't be too hard to make your meetings more exciting, I'm guessing. Um, but really, I'm here to teach you the value of saying something uncomfortable and maybe even raising people's anxiety a little bit to engage them in a conversation. The point is engagement, passionate engagement. Um, and with that, 
by being able to have passionate and engaged discussions, you will produce better results from your team. Um, yeah, I promise you that. Um, the best ideas are going to rise to the top through debate and through interrogation of concepts. And you will also be able to discover a kind of team alliance that would not have been alignment that would not have been possible uh, before people were willing to engage in debate. Great. So that's, that's the thesis here. Uh, before I go any farther, I do want to share who we are as a company. So as you can see, we are Valiantis. We are a platinum solution partner of Atlassian. That means we work very closely with uh, a number of Atlassian products, pretty much the entire product suite. Um, and we consult uh, various companies in their implementation of Jira software, Jira service management, Confluence, Bitbucket. Um, we run migrations uh, from data center to the cloud and, uh, we help implement governance and we have our own team of full stack developers, um, who can create, uh, front end solutions and APIs. Um, and our flagship course, um, for anyone interested is the three day deep dive into Jira, the Jira bootcamp, which is really good for Jira admins and super users. So if you have someone at your company who uses Jira, likely you do, it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, this is a really, really good way to get a foothold on how to make it work. Um, if you are in a Jira instance that has like a million different, say like 200 workflows and maybe 300 custom fields, you might be in a situation where it's a bit of the Wild West and things have gotten away. And um, this bootcamp can start to give you the tools to be able to manage it and carve out your own little uh, place of sanity in all of that chaos. Um, so that is what we provide and who we are as a company. So this is our office in St. Louis. Um, and it's really cute. It's on the third floor of a small building. And, uh, that's the coffee room right there to the left with the, like the little light coming out of it. It's a very important room, um, free coffee, beer on Fridays. Um, and it's a really niche, uh, kind of like neat little place where, where we all get to meet and, and collaborate. Um, however, during the pandemic, this uh, was something that we lost touch with. Um, we moved to a largely remote workforce, and it's only been the recent years that we've come back together. But like many companies, we now have a largely remote workforce um, that works in tandem with our office one. And one thing that the remote workforce really misses are like the uh, gatherings around the lunch table um, to chat. Uh, XBM had a culture and still has in the office or uh, sorry, Valiantis is a culture I still had in the office of uh, meeting, uh, stopping everything for the entire company to have lunch together. And it wasn't particularly small. The whole St. Louis office isn't huge, but it's a place for people to talk about business and personal and bond. And it was a really essential place for us to um, kind of know who we all were in a weird way. So that is... Uh, that's that's kind of been our experience, but now that we have a large remote workforce, we've had to dig a little bit into the tools that exist out there to create that sense of community remotely. And we've started studying them, and that's what's given rise to uh, our team building practice uh, because we started doing these things internally and then spread them externally. So one of the things that we dug into during the pandemic when we were sort of in a place of not, you know, feeling that our culture was eroding and wanting to rebuild it uh, was we read The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. This is uh, an incredible book that details um, the, I don't know if rise and fall is the right way, the, I'll call it the dramatic journey of a team of CEOs who run a fictional company, um, or a team of, of C-suite, they're not all CEOs, but a team of, of C-suite executives who run a fictional company, and how... Um, uh, they were dysfunctional in a number of ways and a, like a new CEO was brought on and she essentially confronts the whole team about their dysfunction, what's going on and works through it with them. And it's a really visceral book. It's written like fiction, even though it's talking about a theory. And uh, I think the writer is quite talented and you can really feel like you're in the room of a, of a uh, poorly performing uh, team with a lot at stake. So um, essentially... 
going back to the the book. So we read it and we were we were curious what these five dysfunctions are and what might be present. Now the 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 way the theory works is each one builds on the next. If you can address the bottom one, then you can address the next one. If you can address that, then you can continue up the pyramid until you're able to address the five key dysfunctions of a team that lead to a lack of performance. These dysfunctions are all more around interpersonal. In some cases, it's process oriented, like you know how frequently you're having meetings or ways of holding people accountable. Um, but often it really deals with the interpersonal discomfort. And you can see with each of these, so an absence of trust that has to do with a, a people thing, a fear of conflict, that's an emotion. We're dealing with fear of engaging in conflict, a lack of commitment. Again, there's a lack of, of there's like confusion there and possibly uh, ambiguity. So maybe some anxiety there. And then avoidance of accountability, that's avoiding the discomfort of accountability. And then inattention to results is, uh, again, avoiding the discomfort of actually looking at how well you're performing. So again, each of these build on each other. And we started reading. Now, the, the thing that we focused on first was an absence of trust because we were bringing on a lot of new people and they weren't familiar with the culture. I have another webinar on that. So I'm going to go ahead and sidestep that a little bit. I'll also be talking about it, though, throughout the webinar here. Um, I'll come back to it. But what we're going to address today is the one that's circled in blue, the fear of conflict. I think people are understandably afraid of conflict. Um, conflict can be uh, uncomfortable and it can even be scary uh, to have. And in some cases, it can be downright detrimental. I mean, in the most extreme case, we could look at... Um, maybe a really bad divorce between people. That is strong conflict with both people on either side feeling really negatively about each other and fighting for two different kind of stories or agendas and they're going up against each other to try and outdo the other or win the conflict. Um, that is a scary situation and if anyone's been through that, you know it can be really difficult to be to be in that. So I think people are understandably afraid of conflict. And... What that can do, in one way, it protects us from having unhealthy conflicts where it's more of a competition, but it also steers us away from productive conflicts um, where there's a possibility to resolve something that um, might not be resolved otherwise. So when I talk about conflict, I just want to say I'm not necessarily talking about a war. Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about a shouting match. Um, I'm simply talking about an anxious situation that needs to be resolved. And... Um, you can think about that as, as many problems that you might have at work. Uh, what's the right way for us to communicate? Should we use Google chat or teams? That could be one thing. And people might have different opinions about what to do about that. What is the right way to move forward? Um, should we use one or the other pros and cons? Um, and there could be strong feelings on either side of that. It's not always just an objective conversation where you're measuring the pros and cons and nobody's involved. If someone's been using Google Chat for years, they're going to feel uncomfortable about wanting to make the shift. And it's more has to do with like familiarity and fear of the unknown. And anyway, point being that that is breeding ground for conflict, positive or not. Um, and one reason why I'm talking about conflict as something that's engaging is because every move and story that's ever been that is often shared with the audience very early on in the story. Now, you guys know if you went to my D&D &D thing that I love storytelling and feel that it's one of kind of like the amazing mediums in the world. And I think about it often. And with a good story, in order to engage the audience, or in the case of Dungeons and Dragons, to engage the players who are both audience and participant, you need to tell them why it's important very early on. What is at stake here? And why are you the one to do something about it? Um, and this happens in movies all the time. If you think about uh, Star Wars, you can think about the um, sort of famous opening scene where the big triangular ship goes above the like over the screen over the planet and then 
this tiny little ship is is there in front of it being pursued and immediately you're like oh wow there's a conflict here and then bang there's blaster fights darth vader's coming in strangling people looking for the rebel plans there's very clearly a conflict and we as the audience are brought in because we want to know what's going to happen we want to see how the situation is resolved to use a more modern example the barbie movie she's living in barbie land and everything is really great until she's at a party one night and she starts to wonder about her existence and gets existential dread. What if I get cellulite on my thighs? What if I'm not pretty anymore? What does that mean? And the that conflict is not like uh, two forces going up against each other, but it's rather her dealing with her own mortality um, and her own existence and coming to terms with it. And the movie is a humorous look, a humorous but deep look at, at what is it what is her journey and what conclusion does she come to? And it doesn't end until that internal conflict is resolved for her internally. Um, so let's go back to, to work. Um, something is ultimately at stake for your team. Um, that might be the, uh, if you're going to be able to meet a certain work deadline, if your product is going to do what you promise it's going to do, if your team is going to be able to uh, deliver on something, if you are going to be able to uh, sell enough of a particular product in order to get a raise in the coming year, all of these things produce a bit of anxiety for us because they are uncertain. And so we feel we need to take action. Um. And there could be consequences on either side. If you fail, there could be consequences. And if you succeed, there could be consequences that are directly going to impact your future. And this is why conflict is really important to bring up with your teams. Because if there are issues that are going to impact all of their lives, you need to be able to discuss them as a team and address them even if it's uncomfortable. And that's going to be what makes your meetings exciting. So... My first tool that I would like to offer you is present the conflict up front. When you're having a meeting uh, with your team and there's something important for them to discuss, as soon as you can in the process, present to them what is at stake and why it's important. That's what I mean when I say present the conflict up front. Let them know if this doesn't work, here's what's going to happen. And if this works, here's what could happen. And here's what's standing in our way. Now, this is the moment where you're going to have to reflect on your own situation. Because I don't know what keeps you up at night. But I guarantee that you do. Um, what issues are there that you've been avoiding bringing to your team? And how could you frame them in a way that engages people in the conversation? Um, I want to give an example here so that you can see, uh, so you can see that. So this is a quote from uh, the book that I was talking about from Five Dysfunctions of a Team. The new CEO has taken her entire kind of executive uh, team out to a retreat. And many of them are skeptical and not really sure why they're there and are annoyed that they're not able to um, like work with their customers, move their work forward. They feel that this is a waste of time. And... She starts the retreat off by saying this quote, and I'll read it out for you. We have a more experienced and talented executive team than any of our competitors. We have more cash than they do. Thanks to Martin and his team, we have better core technology. And we have a more powerful board of directors. Yet in spite of all that, we are behind two of our competitors in terms of both revenue and customer growth. Can anybody tell me why that is? Silence. Now she has an assessment of why that is. And I'm sure that as a team lead, you have an assessment of why you think uh, your team might be failing to perform in some area. Um, and it will be good to prepare ahead of time why you think that is and have some talking points on it. Uh, like bringing up a problem is great, but be prepared to offer solutions as well. She is in the book, certainly. But this is what I mean when I say bring the conflict up early. Let them know she's talking about their strengths, about their great core technology, their powerful executive team, um, their, their resources. And she's also calling them out 
and saying that in spite of all that, we are behind our competitors in terms of customer growth and revenue. And then she asked the question, why is that? And the why is really important because she's asking the team and she's asking them to engage in a debate about that conversation, about that rather uncomfortable conversation of why is this not working for us? This is pretty key. Um, as a leader, I think we'll often want to come to the table and have all the answers, know why things aren't working. But one of the biggest values of a of conflict is that you don't have the answers and it's a discussion with the team. If you're willing to approach it as a discussion and hear all of their perspectives and openly debate with them and encourage them to debate with each other, then you get something pretty amazing at the end, which is the benefit of everybody's ideas and perspectives and you get buy-in. When people are heard, they generally will feel more bought into the final solution, even if it doesn't incorporate what they discussed. I've seen this with many teams that I've worked with. It's kind of remarkable. And I think it's just a part of human nature that we all feel the need to be understood and heard. Um, the second benefit is that you can win over people. Um, outside of hearing them, you can debate with them and they can be won over to your ideas and you'll get a greater sense of alignment on a better final product if you're willing to do this. But it does require sitting in that uncomfortable silence after presenting something that people might not want to hear or talk about. Um, so let's talk about the benefits of people who engage in passionate debate. They will make better decisions. Flaws will be presented openly. New possibilities might be opened up that take those flaws into consideration. And the team's creativity will be unlocked as they strive towards solving the problem. Also, it creates engagement. So think about for yourself, your own experience. How much better are the results of meetings in which you were engaged and actively participating in them versus the ones where you're checked out and bored? I'm hoping that that just speaks for itself. Um, great. Now, I want to acknowledge something else. So I was going to come back to this. Um, stoking the flames of conflict can all come crashing down if you do not have trust with a team. There can be a genuine problem here if a team lacks trust with one another. That means that they, gen that they don't understand each other as individuals and they're not willing to give each other the benefit of the doubt and they're not willing to give up their own perspective. They feel threatened in some way by the other person. That is where conflict can really break down. Um, so right-hand column, you can see unhealthy and destructive conflict versus healthy and productive conflict. This is where the fear of conflict comes out, um, comes into play because we're all basically afraid of the right-hand column. Um, and it can be really bad for, for a company. It can cause uh, an incredible amount of stress for individuals. It can cause a lot of anger, reactivity, blame. This is the kind of thing that can keep people up at night when you're venting to your spouse at the end of the day about somebody who upset you. Um, and it could come down to power struggles or two different stories competing for, um, for dominance. So you want to be on the lookout for this. If this is what's actually going on in a team, trust building is really the solution, not, um, provoking conflict. Um, this is kind of going back to square one and looking at, okay, how can we build understanding for each other and start to see each other as human beings? Um, so one of the key things that you'll notice in the left-hand column of healthy, uh, conflict is that there is ideological debate. It's about the ideas. It's about what is best for us. Should we approach this situation aggressively? Why? Should we approach this situation slowly and wait for the other side to make the first move? Why? Should we go see the Barbie movie? Why? <laughs> um, but it's, 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 it's around the ideologies that, that are being debated, and it's about the ideas, not the people. Um, one thing that you can see in unproductive conflict is false attributions, people jumping to conclusions. Like, you're just saying that because you want to disagree with me. You're just saying that to be difficult. 
stuff like that. That is generally not why people say things. <laughs> From what I've learned, people don't super like or view themselves as wanting to be difficult. Um, that's when you get into false attribution problems, which is basically like saying, you know, I'm only a bad person when there's been a lot of traffic and someone says something that annoys me. Um, that's, but that's my excuse. That's like, I'm allowed to do that. However, that person is just annoying. They're not, they probably didn't have a bad day or, you know, have a rough morning or a difficult argument with someone like, so basically it's taking someone's, uh, taking, like you're willing to give yourself the benefit of the doubt, but not someone else. Um, so noticing that. Anyway, I go into a lot of these topics in our trust webinar, which you are more than welcome to sign up for. Um, you can find the link to it on xbm.com and register for our next one if you want to come. So, all right. Those are the dangers of a lack of trust. Um, and I think it's understandable that things can get personal even in a healthy situation, and they can be uncomfortable. It's tough to say something like, hey, I'm sorry, Sally, but I just don't think that your marketing plan is a really good one. That's going to feel bad. She's probably to some degree going to feel identified with the plan that she's created and invested in. So a team that has a healthy amount of trust can take the discomfort and, and the sort of upset of someone saying that their marketing plan isn't very good or their, that their approach won't work. They hear that not as a personal attack, but as a criticism of the idea. They might say something like, well, why do you think that? Do you have another solution? Even if they're a little frustrated or uncomfortable. Um, and then you can have open debates on the ideas in the marketing plan. Oh boy. Sorry. I've got a kitten trying to climb on me. Huh? Okay, you're down. You're down. You're going down. You're going down. All right. Um, basically, you're looking, can the decisions of the team hold up to the application of reason and logic from all individuals? Um, point being, though, when there is trust, we know that the other individual has our best interests and the interests of the team at heart. We know them. We trust them. And so we're willing to hear hard truths and let our guard down, even if it makes us uncomfortable, we will let our walls down. It is hard, but it is essential. Um, so ensure that there's a basis of trust. Um, I think that as a leader, uh, let's see. yeah, I think that as a leader, um, it can be easy or tempting to want to just pick a side and the one that you agree with, but just know that the goal of an argument is not that one side or the other gets their way. Um, just that both sides come to a deeper understanding of the issue at hand and come up with a better solution because of it. You don't need to say that out loud, although you can if you want to reinforce that for your team. But even just knowing that in the back of your head while you're conducting a meeting is going to give you a lot of strength and a good place to come from that will keep everyone trusting you throughout the process. Um, no one wants to feel like you're playing politics with them, but rather that you just have the best interests of the, the team at heart um, on the whole. And if you start coming at things from an authoritarian perspective of, well, we're just going to do this because I say so, um, and not give the team the opportunity to debate, you're going to lose a lot of buy-in. Um, and you can think of times where someone has just told you to do something, whether you agree with it or not, it doesn't necessarily feel good. Um, and doesn't necessarily make you want to do the thing, even if it's the right thing to do. Okay, let's move on. Man, I have a super aggressive kitten. Like, I love him, but man, he really wants it. Um, okay. All right. So, what do you do if you have team members who won't speak up? Where you can sense that there's something wrong, but they won't tell you. This is the third job, and it is largely the leader, the job of a leader on the team. I want to be super clear. A leader is not just someone who has a position of authority, is the team leader, is the scrum master. This can literally be any team member that's willing to step up and, uh, and ask a uh, tough question, which is, is there anything else? Or, hey, uh, you seem a little bothered by this. Or, hey, uh, Brian, we haven't heard from you this whole meeting. Is there something on your mind? Being willing to uh, dig up buried conflict 
is a really useful tool. And it's just something that you want to be aware of and listen for. Um, generally, as the team lead or as someone who's connected to a lot of people on the team, you're really well positioned for this because you've had one-on-ones with a number of people and likely know people's um, reservations, their opinions, their stances on things. And you're going to have the best insight onto if somebody has something that they're not addressing that's important to them. Um, so reminding people that uh, we have the goal of engaging in conflict, it's important to, and even setting up the value of it. Um, and uh, that person might be holding back for any number of reasons. It could be that they're afraid and they don't want to upset the apple cart or um, they're not sure when to cut in. They might be very introverted. All things like that could, could be going on. Um, but your job here is to call it out so that it doesn't come up at the water cooler later. Remind everyone we have the same goal and the conflict here exists because we want it to succeed. So it is healthy for the team to talk about these issues. Then, whoops, sorry, I didn't make a slide for number four. Uh, number four, though, validate them. When a team member does engage in debate, validate them. If they are willing to say something uncomfortable, but that is useful for the conversation, tell them, thank you for sharing. That is exactly what we want to hear. Jackie, what do you think of that? I know that we're all adults and, and it should be obvious to do this, but I have found remarkably that when you tell a team that what they're doing is right and it's all okay, when they air their disagreements, they seem very relieved to know that they didn't do something wrong by saying that. I've worked with plenty of clients where I'm scared they're going to laugh at me when I tell them that, but I am pleased to say that often they feel more relaxed and more confidently debate their point after they've done that. Um, I found that by and large, folks do want to treat each other well and they want to make the best products that they can. Um, and they just need to be given some cool, some tools and some encouragement and some room to learn. Um, the point really with all this is to make a safe place to fail and pick yourself up again. Um, that it's okay to discuss what's not working and the key is just not to take it personally and, and aim uh, at the bigger picture and, and aim to address these things before they become bigger problems that we don't talk about. Um, you might have some kind of whistleblower personalities on your uh, team. Those are super useful. You want to know what they're thinking. They might not always be right. Sometimes they build a whistle about stuff that's like, okay, so what if there's a not a period on the end of that sentence on our slide? Maybe not the worst thing. Um, but in some cases, and, and in fact, in many cases, they can head it off before the pass and give you what you need in order to um, have your team succeed. So that's that. Um, all right, we're going to jump into Dungeons and Dragons. So I think what I would call this topic is a safe place to practice. Um, so at Valiantis, we have devised a safe space to practice conflict and other skills. We believe these skills are incredibly important when dealing with clients, partners, and internal colleagues. So social skills are key across the board. Um, the lack of these skills creates unnecessary conflicts. Uh, it walls people off from each other for no apparent reason. It causes bottlenecks in your process when people don't know how to address issues productively. So we created a low stakes environment to do that in an imaginary game and it's called Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, that game, that one, the one that was in Stranger Things, the one that the movie came out about recently, the one that people played in the 80s and still play today. It's in its fifth edition of the rule set. And uh, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan. Um, why is this useful, though, um, for this? So, and, and how is it at all similar to what we're dealing with as a team when we're getting together at our, our daily stand-up? I think that's a really good, good question. Thank you for asking. So... It's a board game, but it's not structured like other board games. There aren't a defined set of rules. It's improvisational, and it's guided by a leader. And everyone else is a participant um, who plays uh, a character. But similar to our work meetings, um, 
it's conducted mostly as a conversation between people where we're putting our focus on each other. And from time to time, we're turning off and looking at external tools and using those as a frame of reference. While at work, we might look at a Miro board in D and D we might look at say a map of the world covered in post-it notes um, and consider that. So mirror board of a workflow, post-it note of a fantasy world, actually remarkably similar and revolves like similar interpersonal skills of communication strategy, keeping everything in kind of a unified area and most importantly, discussing as a team, uh, what you're going to do. What I really love about this game is, uh, it has a dungeon master, which is the kind of the leader and facilitator of the experience. And their main role is to present problems to the team and narrate the story for them. So they narrate the consequences of the team's actions, but what's really nice is they are both a leader for the team, showing people how to do things, and also will frequently step back and let the team talk and debate about debate amongst themselves the best course of action. This is an open-ended storytelling game, which means there are no preset solutions to how to play it or make choices in it. Unlike a board game, which has certain things that you can do and you cannot do, this game is designed to facilitate spontaneous, improvised storytelling together. And each player plays a different character who has heroic challenges that are presented to the team and obstacles that they have to overcome. So I'll explain a super simple scenario for you. Uh playing the game might look something like the everyone's gathered around the table and the dungeon master says something along these lines. You all find yourselves standing on top of the howling cliffs. The wind blows strongly against you and you can feel it uh, buffeting the sides of your armor. And you look and you can see birds, a single uh, falcon flying high up above. The ground is rocky here and far, far, far below in the cliffs are the water and a long rope dangling all the way off the edge. As you all stand up there, one of you notices a boat going to the base of the cliffs and a single man climbs out and begins climbing up the long rope. What do you all do? At that point, the team gets to talk among themselves and decide how they want to react to the situation. Individuals can say, well, I want to walk off to the side and say, hey, what are you doing down there? Maybe they say that. The dungeon master says, the person looks up when you say that, but then they just keep on climbing. Um, then the team has to decide what they're going to do again. And they might say something like, all right, well, let's split up. One of you wait for him to come up and then kick him off the edge. And then the rest of us, uh, we're just going to go ahead. Um, and the story continues like that, where sort of you guys are making decisions as a team and the dungeon master is responding to those. So that's, that's how it works in a nutshell. Um, so let's see. What's, what I really like about this is that the story can really build on itself and it can create a lot of laughter and creativity from how people are playing. People can be very inventive, learn how to trust their instincts and even surprise themselves with their contributions to the story. And over time, over a handful of sessions, players can become really invested in the story that they're telling and really come to care. And that unifies the team in a way that doesn't always happen in a work project. One great thing is that everybody creates their own characters, and their own reason for going on this adventure, which tends to invest people pretty strongly. We don't always, in our work situations, talk about why we care about working on this particular project or why it matters or is personal to us. Um, and well, this all happens through the lens of a character, and isn't the players themselves, um, they're still investing their own emotions. And if they're doing it well, they're empathizing with their character and care about that character succeeding at their projects uh, or their quests. So uh, the team can then feel the thrill of accomplishment as they take down their enemies, defy danger, and showcase real courage and trust. 
Um, the game can also stimulate this sense of purpose once they discover as a team what they want to accomplish in this fantasy world. It's open-ended, and I might present quests to them, but they get to decide who they are and what kind of quests they want to pursue. Um, so essentially, for everyone who's unfamiliar, in case I haven't made this abundantly clear, it is an unscripted choose-your-own-adventure, kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure book, except when you say, instead of just being able to have two options, you either like go to the basement or go to the kitchen or something, turn to page, whatever, to do that. The options are basically what the dungeon master can imagine and what seems reasonable. Like, could you actually do that? Would it actually work? So there's some uh, degree of uh, trying to hold the world together and have it have a... Uh, what's a good word for it? Consistency. Consistency, I think. Um, people tend to like that. It makes the experience feel more real for the, for the players. Um, let's give you an example, though. So I am going to take you to an example of our confluence space for one of our games. It's really fun. I, I really think you're going to uh, enjoy this. Okay, I'll just let this boot up. Please hold. Okay, I'm going to log in here. I'm going to make that way, 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 way bigger. There we go. Oop. There we go. Okay, maybe a little too big. Nice. All right, let's jump into uh, Oasis XP. This is a game I ran back in July. Um, so all of our players get uh, a confluence space of their own um, that gives them reference to the important materials they need to play. Um, and it gives them each their own unique uh, adventure log, which is uh, the, their journal as a group where they note take their adventures from session to session. So in this one, um, I'll just quickly go over some of these. Um, we have a section on game mechanics, which goes over the roles of the player and the game master in more detail. And then it talks about the system mechanics, which is how the game works in terms of how the dice rolling works and um, how we adjudicate uncertain, uh, how, how we use the rules to help guide the story. The big picture, that's what it does. Um, the rules are there just to make the story dramatic and interesting and, and help you know, steer it in cool directions. Um, everybody gets to pick a character that they want to play. Um, this is a, kind of like a sample character sheet that you could get. And this is kind of the name and uh, a little bit more of a description than each character is a personal belief, kind of like a family background, and then a motivation, like an internal core motivation as a, as, a, uh, as a character, as a being. And this is, uh, in some cases, our players will create characters. This is a case of a pre-made one that I hand out. Um, but the best, generally the games work best when the player feels emotionally connected in some way to the motivation where they can empathize and understand uh, who this character is and why, you know, they might, they might, uh, uh want to be a hero or an adventurer. So that's it. Um, so we have details of the game mechanics. This is interesting for people who are into it, but they're actually pretty simple. Um, and you do not need to be an expert to understand it. Sorry, my cats are fighting. Um, so then people will all pick a character. Uh, in this story, you play members of a military group called the Flaming Fist. You can see they've got this kind of like red and gold in their armor. And they are, simply put, colonizers. Um, this story takes place on a vast uh, dark rainforest, like high fantasy. Um, and uh, they have sort of like landed on the edge of it and are like, dealing with the threats inside of it and are going after things like gold and, uh, and treasure. Um, and here are a couple of the examples of characters you can play. I'm just going to show a few of them. Um, but uh, this is Nova. She's really cool. Don't mess with my family and her motivation is to get personal commendations. Um, she's really cool if you want to play someone who's super loyal and devoted and wants to succeed within the system. Uh, we've already looked at him. Here's one who's a little bit different. This is a magic user who uh, is kind of a black sheep in the military. And she's got this wanting to prove her worth thing going on, but she's really powerful and has a lot of magic. Um, so that's kind of 
again, like people will find characters that they're drawn to and want to play them, or again, we'll create them and I'll, you know, I'll go through a guided process with groups that I work with. So anyway, I'll just quickly give you, you can pause the video if you want to look at any of these and look at them in more detail. Um, we, for those of us watching live, we post this on YouTube afterwards. Um, anyway, so that is how that works. And after that, I'll talk with folks on how uh, we use our imagination here and different ways to sort of exercise the muscle of the imagination, um, as well as how to role play. And then we talk a little bit about a deep working agreement. Uh, because the game is sort of spontaneous, um, things can come up, uh, and it's also like dangerous, things can come up that are... Uh, they can be uncomfortable or feel unsafe. It, a very simple thing would be someone has a fear of spiders, say, and then it comes up in the story and then they feel uncomfortable and they're not having a good time. So this is a chance just for us to, for people to know that in order to have fun together, um, like <laughs> we need to make sure that we're keeping each other safe. Um, this here is my favorite D and D group. This is actually a group online on YouTube. Um, who play, they are called Critical Role, and they are a group of nerdy voice actors uh, who live in LA, and they have the most successful like live D&D channel. Um, it's been going on for like four or five years. And they play D&D live with each other. They're really good friends, and I put them on here because they do an exceptional job of covering like really rich and sometimes heavy or painful material, like death or um, just scary situations. Uh, which is very entertaining to watch, but they do an amazing job of keeping each other safe and engaged during the environment, during the, uh, the game. So I put them in here. Um, also, for those of you out there watching, my fiance and I just created a little podcast um, called Critical Role Models um, that talks about them. So if you're super interested in D and D, go into that. Um, if not, don't worry about it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's up on, on Spotify. Uh, so what else do we have? Here we have the fantasy world here. This is uh, the jungle world where I go into some detail about the jungle. It has zombies in it. And it's got this big map of the world that they'll use. And then we've got uh, the adventurer's log. And here the group, this is kind of this old group. These are the notes that they took from session to session so that they could remember what happened and what was relevant for them. Um, Play just has some handout materials. The debrief is really important, though. Um, so I'll go back here as I talk about debrief. Let's see. Got the jungle. This game is essentially experiential learning. So while it's incredibly fun and creative and engaging, what it does is it models, we can model behavior that we want to see on our teams. We can model productive conflict, trust building, vulnerability, accountability. Um, and uh, transparency also. Uh, good planning, risk taking. Uh, all that can be practiced inside the game and it is a safe space to learn these things. So at the end of every episode, I'll, I'll put the brakes on and I'll ask people, what do you think you learned from this game? and give folks a chance to talk and debrief. And this is probably where the most value actually comes out during the game. Well, the experience can be wonderful and sort of teach people that they're safe with each other and they can play, which is incredible for, for the trust level. This is the place where they can actually talk about what worked and what didn't work. And my role is generally just to reflect what I saw and say something like... Uh, hey, so I noticed that um, after this particular scene in the game, uh, there was kind of an awkward pause and you all didn't seem like what you knew what to do. And then eventually uh, you guys figured it out later. What do you think happened there? And, uh, and why do you think that was? And then letting people talk it out and have this discussion uh, about why they acted the way they did and it generally moves in the direction of a, a more productive thing. And, and I'm just trying to make sort of like the, the unconscious conscious, like why, why did you act that way? How did that happen? And even, you know, that didn't work out super well for you guys. 
how do you think you could have approached that differently? It's another, another way we can do that. So reflections are really important, kind of a key part of the whole experiential learning thing. All right, guys, that is pretty much it for the talk today. Um, I want to thank everybody who came. Um, you can book these sessions with us uh, if you like. Uh, I do that for plenty of different teams. Um, we have a couple of different lengths of sessions. Uh, there are three hour ones and one or three or four half, we'll call them half day ones. Um, and then one hour sessions. Um, and they are both designed to produce results and just give different results depending on the level of commitment. But I will work with the team lead one-on-one -on -one to determine what is the best fit for your team and make sure that, um, that your team is bought into it. Generally, we'll start with the one-hour ones before we move into um, before we move into anything deeper. And uh, I'll work with you as the team lead on picking a genre and a style of story that is interesting to you and you think your team will enjoy. Um, right now, it's kind of the spooky season, so I'm going to be running some horror games in the upcoming weeks. So if you're interested in horror, please feel free to reach out and message me. My LinkedIn is going to be in the... Um, in the webinar chat. And I really enjoy working with this on teams. We have an awesome adventure that I just wrote um, called the mask of the worms. And uh, yeah, again, designed to be resolved in one hour and give teams a really great taste of, uh, of the gaming experience. So that's essentially how that works. Um, we already went through the demo and uh, yeah, we are Valiantis. We are a consulting company for uh, Atlassian products, and we believe in the power of teams, and we believe that uh, in kind of like the whole picture of people, processes, and tools. So we're here to help you with your governance, with your team building needs, and with the correct application of your tools and creating practices um, sort of across the way. I also have a flyer um, in the chat that you all should see that has a list of some of our other offerings that I have um, outside of D&D. Um, that includes Myers-Briggs sessions, retrospectives, um, and what's the last one? Oh, team kickoffs to establish roles and responsibilities. Um, are there any questions? Uh, we do have a QA, and a and I've got a little bit of time here if anybody watching wants to pop a question in, I'm happy to answer. Well, great. Uh, I'll see you next time. Do, do, do.